What if sex was no big deal? What if who you had sex with or not was simply not important? Sex is a fundamental part of the human existence and in some way or another is entirely transcultural and universal. Who we have sex with, how we do it, what for, in which contexts, are questions which have preoccupied us, at least here in the global north, for centuries. In 1984, Gail Rubin created something that she called the wheel of sexual practice. And at the center of that wheel, she positioned sex that was good, sex that we're supposed to have, sex that we're supposed to want to have, in what she called the charmed middle. Around the outside, she positioned sex which is considered to be deviant or sinful in some way, in what she called the outer limits. Now, this distinction between sex which is good and sex which is not is informed in part by family, by education, by um, religious discourses, as well as by the state. At the center, you might find things like heterosexual sex, monogamous sex, sex with adults, sex with just one other adult. Around the outside, Rubin positioned things like masturbation, pornography, group sex, sadomasochistic sex, sex for money. And what we might think of now about this distinction between good and bad sex has certainly evolved over the past few decades, certainly even over the past few years. But this distinction between sex that is sanctioned and that which is not continues to pervade our understandings of social life, even in contexts that we consider to be liberal, even in societies that we consider to be permissive. Sex is such an important and fundamental organizing principle from the creation of a nation through to the regulation of a population, right through to how it is that we feel about ourselves. So why am I saying that sex doesn't need to matter? And more than this, why am I saying that in a context where sex doesn't matter, we could lead lives which are freer, fairer, and more pleasurable? From Mother Marquis de Sade, through to Richard Kraft Ebbing, from Sigmund Freud, right through to Michel Foucault, the way in which sex has been studied and analyzed and catalogued and importantly pathologized is well recognized. And it is this preoccupation with sex that sustains things like contemporary rape culture, which normalizes sexual violence. It sustains inequalities and supports patriarchal power relations, which are oppressive for all of us. The work of undoing this attachment to sex will not be the work of a moment. But what I'm suggesting is that if we do it, we can transform the relationships that we have with ourselves, with each other, even with strangers, and the world more broadly. We can start with shame. In a world where sex doesn't matter, we can uncouple sex from shame. Now, I'm not suggesting that people feel shame about the sex that they are or are not having, but at a discursive level, shame informs the way in which we approach sex and sexuality. It is shame that supports anxieties around sex education in schools or the sexual citizenship rights of disabled people or squeamishness about sex work. It is shame that supports anxieties around the sexuality of children or the sexualization of children from slut shaming through to image-based sexual violence, which we call revenge pornography, right through to sexual paternalism. The way in which we think about these things, and certainly the way in which we're encouraged to in a mainstream society, is laced with shame about sexual desire. Whether it is that of men, of women, with themselves, or with each other. But in a world where sex was de-dramatized, where it was just no big deal. We could take all these things on at face value, unencumbered by the baggage that is entailed in a context where sex matters. Let's take the criminal justice system. In England and Wales, sex crimes are amongst the hardest to convict. In 2020, over 52,000 rapes were reported to the police. 843 resulted in a conviction. That is a rate of 1.6%. In 2019, the figure was 1.7%. In 2020, 
In 2018, over 58,000 rapes were reported to the police and just under 2,000 resulted in a conviction. This is a flawed system and it is a system flawed by shame. It is a system flawed by police force which will not send forward tricky or ambiguous cases to the Crown Prosecution Service. It's a system flawed by the mobilisation of rape myths in a courtroom to discredit a victim of rape. So within a heteronormative framing, uh, if, for example, she took photos of them in bed after the attack or was known to have had rape fantasies or continued to text him after the attack, these might, stories might all be used in order to mobilise rape myths which undermine her credibility as a credible victim of rape. It's flawed by a jury system which is reluctant to convict a man, especially a young man, of rape. And let us not forget the thousands of cases which never get that far, either because victims cease to pursue their cases or simply don't report them in the first place. But in a world where sex doesn't matter, we could think of rape the same way that we do any other violent crime against the person. The word rape comes from the Latin rapere, meaning to ravish or to seduce, but also to seize, to steal away, to transport off. The crime of rape was invented to solve the problem of men losing the marriageable worth of their daughters who had been seduced or ravished or raped by other men. At its heart, rape is a property crime. Do we really lose so very much by stepping away from it? In a context where sex doesn't matter, we could treat rape as we do any other violent crime against the person. Like, for example, grievous bodily harm with intent, a crime that carries a maximum life sentence. In a context like where sex doesn't matter like this, with this we can transform justice outcomes for perpetrators and for victims. In such a context, rape myths might have less credence in a courtroom and juries less reluctant to label a man a rapist. And men and women who come forward about their experiences would be met in the same way they would be if they had suffered any other violent crime. That is, it would be recognised that it was traumatic, that it was illegal, that the criminal justice system takes it seriously, and that they are met with sympathy by the courts. But that's not the only way in which, when sex is no big deal, it frees us from the shackles of shame which lead to these socially unjust outcomes. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting a libertine free-for-all. This is not about creating a sex-positive apology for behaviour which is questionable or downright dreadful. Consent still matters. Sex crimes still happen. Rather, this is about creating a world which opens up avenues for us to really tr truly transform questions of sexual and gender justice. As Foucault says, sexual practice ought to have elements of transgression in it. There is a world of pleasure to explore, including pleasures that we haven't yet discovered. And pushing up against something in terms of transgression is a really important way in which to self-determine and lead lives which are meaningful and rich and satisfying. Just ask anybody who plays with fire from time to time or who takes calculated risks. Think of risks that you take yourself and why you take them. There is something pleasurable about pushing up against the limits of what the body can do, even sexual ones, if we want to. Because this is not about creating a blueprint for a world in which everything is safe and sanitised and circumscribed, in which nothing can go wrong. This is about opening up a world in which we can explore. Or not. It can go well. Or not. We can be ambiguous, we can be contradictory, we could want to have our cake and eat it, and that's okay, because in a world where sex doesn't matter, it just becomes another thing that we do. And if it goes wrong, and if we don't like it, and we change our minds, or we want additional support, or better understanding, or clearer knowledge, we can address each of those needs, because we have created the conditions for consensual sex to happen without shame. And that's not all. Because when we are having consensual sex without shame, we can re-center pleasure. Pleasure cannot be commodified in the same way that desire is. Pleasure 
stands outside of the controlling mechanisms of things like the wheel of sexual practice or of victim blaming or of rape myths. If we detach ourselves from our current thinkings around sex and sexuality through pleasure, we can open up our understanding of sexuality beyond the heteronormative, penis-centric, penetrative, genital-oriented practice. Because pleasure, unlike desire, unlike sexuality, cannot be pathologized by medical and juridical discourses. By putting pleasure at the heart of shameless sex, we can open up new ways of playing with fire, of being with ourselves and building relationships including ways that we have not yet imagined. Thank you.